everyone, and thank you for being here today. We will wait a moment to begin as people continue to join. Hi, thank you for joining us. We'll begin shortly as we wait for a few more people to join the event. Hi everyone, we will go ahead and get started. I'm Kate Derrick in the Division of Communications here at Vanderbilt, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today on the Return to Campus Town Hall for students and families. Today's event is being recorded and will be posted online, including the Vanderbilt University YouTube channel. Today, you will hear from incoming Chancellor Daniel Deermeyer, who will step into the role of Vanderbilt's ninth Chancellor on July 1st, our interim Chancellor and Provost, Susan Wente, and Vice Chancellor for Administration, Eric Kopstein. They will each share information about the return to campus plan for fall 2020. Then we will have a question and answer session to respond to a series of questions that were submitted ahead of time, as well as those asked live on today's call. I am going to paste the link where you can send your questions. So if you have questions, please use that form in the URL that I've shared uh, with everyone here on Zoom. We have a team that's collecting all of the questions as soon as they come in and we will address as many of them as we can during today's event. We won't be able to get to every question, but we are continuously updating the FAQs on the Return to Campus website as questions come in. As a reminder, you can also visit the Return to Campus website where those FAQs are at vu.edu slash fall 2020, or you can call the fall 2020 helpline, which is open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time. And that number is 615-322-4357. And you can find that number on the Return to Campus website. With that, I will turn it over to incoming Chancellor Daniel Deermeyer to begin. Thank you, Kate. Uh, and good morning to all of you. And most importantly, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Um, thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Um, I know this has been an eagerly awaited moment, um, our return to campus plan. Uh, many of you will have seen uh, the announcement that uh, went out early in the week. And our goal today is to give you a little bit more background in detail about what we're planning to do, to tell you about the process that led to the decisions that were made, and to then, of course, be able to have a discussion with you and answer as many questions as we can. Uh, let me start out uh, with uh, thanking the, the team at Vanderbilt that has just done a tremendous job under the leadership uh, of Interim Chancellor and Provost Susan Venti uh, and, Vice, and, and Vice Chancellor Eric Kopstein. The amount of detail, diligence and thoughtfulness that went into the plan, I think will be evident from everything you're gonna see. Um, I wanna just make sure that, that, that I also mentioned a couple of caveats. Um, there are some details that still need to be worked out We'll talk about those. And then secondly, 
Um, this is a period of profound and persistent uncertainty, and we all need to be aware that uh, as situations change, particularly in the environment uh, that we're facing uh, uh, in a particular you know, metropolitan area or uh, things that we learn about the therapeutic um, aspects of the, how we can treat the virus um, or the, uh, the, the advances in testing, uh, we may have to make adjustments down the line. So uh, with that, um, why don't we go over and uh, start the slides. Okay, if we could go to the next slide, please. And one more. So this is uh, an overview over the guiding principles that have led our decision-making. First and foremost was the goal to ensure the health and well-being of our community. And when we think about what drove our decision-making, it was all based on the mission of Vanderbilt University. Vanderbilt is known for commitment to residential living and learning. And um, our goal is to, to ensure that we have the best possible education experiments for all of our students and invite them back to campus. But that needs to be done in the context of ensuring their health and well-being. Uh, that has to do uh, with thinking about prevention measures. And also very importantly, as I mentioned before, uh, the ability to deal with the potential for resurgence researchers uh, in cases, how do we deal with them? How do we handle them? What are the specific uh, health um, steps that we will take in order to ensure the healthy and well-being of all our entire community? If we go to the next slide, please. I wanna tell you a little bit about the process here. So this was a very deliberate process, firmly rooted in data and analysis and research. So we were using, so we were using all the resources both that the university had and then the entire public health community had to inform our decision-making. And then um, the leadership um, drove the plan as I was talking about. Uh, we had ongoing discussions um, with the board and there's a special ad hoc um, committee that uh, the board, that me members of the board served and that informed the decision-making. And then very importantly, we had a variety uh, of health advisory task forces, a continue, uh, con uh, an university continued working group um, so we had a variety of different subcommittees that informed the decision making. And then I want to highlight uh, the crucial importance uh, played by our relationship uh, with the Vanderbilt University Medical Center. As you all know, uh, VUMC is one of the leading academic medical centers in the country, and uh, they have done a tremendous job in working with the region, with the metropolitan area, with the state, in really informing and collaborating uh, with Tennessee's and national response uh, to, the, to the coronavirus, to COVID-19. Uh, the academic medical centers really have been the backbone of the country's response uh, to this crisis, to COVID-19, and nowhere more uh, than in Nashville with the help of uh, VUMC, Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Uh, many of you know that some of the leading experts in the country are part of a medical school, uh, and I have been actively involved with this. Uh, uh, just to give you a couple of examples, uh, Mark Dennison did the foundation work for remdesivir, the only effective treatment against COVID-19 at this point. Jim Crow is one of the leading researchers that works on antibody treatments. And our intensive care uh, capabilities in pulmonary care are some of the best in the country. So both from a research point of view and from a point of view of clinical care, the partnership with Vanderbilt University Medical Center couldn't be better and has been of tremendous importance um, of developing this plan and how we're gonna implement it moving forward. And this is also true for the fact that we have a School of Nursing. So you'll see repeatedly how the School of Nursing is an additional asset that we can bring to the table uh, to inform our plan, but also then um, utilize students and faculty from the School of Nursing to implement it and administer it. If we go to the next slide, please. So here are, the, here are the core principles that have driven where we are. Number one, most importantly, everything is driven by our mission is to provide an impactful transformative education for our students. We want to need to do it in the context of the continuing pandemic and the challenges uh, that this poses for us. We'll, you will use every possible information, data, modeling that our faculty have done uh, that we know from other environments 
you see below a whole variety of other institutions and commissions that have informed our decision making had to have different guidelines that will that have that have informed our particular policies and then very importantly um, everything we're going to do forward will continue to be informed um, by uh, additional information policies guidelines um, that are based on national state local and public health guidance so you'll see a lot of information today a lot of detail i think it's important for you to get a sense for how for how the plan was put together and what its core elements are and with that i'm going to hand it over to interim chancellor and provost susan venti well, thank you very much, Chancellor Dermeyer, and I want to thank all of our students and families for joining us this morning as we talk with you about our return to campus plan. We all know that the last few months have not been easy, and our students in particular have had to be incredibly patient. Thank you for that. You've shown incredible resilience and open-mindedness as we've navigated what is truly a historic time for all universities across the country. So today we're going to offer some details. We're going to talk about many different things, coursework, classrooms, physical spaces, residential strategies, and our university health and safety protocols. I want to mention and, and reinforce again, as Chancellor Diermeyer did, that our decisions have been guided by multiple key factors, our commitment to protecting the health and safety of our Vanderbilt community as much as possible, and our commitment to providing an excellent education to all of our students. So we've developed a plan that has multiple phases. And on this next slide, you'll see how we've laid that out in a, a general sense across different types of activities that go on on campus. This plan is flexible, it's mission-driven, focused on research and on education. And we have been developing the protocols um, at every step of this plan so that we can be testing them and ensuring that they're ready to go for when we bring students back to campus. We launched phase one of this on May 18th. That phase focused on restarting, ramping back up, on-campus research. And we transitioned to phase two um, and started transitioning to phase two on June 8th, which involved expanding those types of research activities um, that are going on on campus. I can tell you that both of these phases have gone remarkably well. We've brought over 1,700 faculty, staff, and students back to campus during those two phases so far. And <clears throat> these individuals are following the protocols. They are um, making discoveries. They are conducting their scholarship. And this gives us really great confidence as we continue to move forward and plan for phase three and for phase four. So our next steps in terms of this um, will be to continue wrapping up those research operations, but also, as you can see, to be ready for on-campus activity. Now, the critical aspect of these phases is shown on the next slide, and that is our campus-wide prevention protocols. These protocols have been developed uh, by working with experts at the medical center, experts at our School of Nursing, by um, <clears throat> consulting with public health guidelines from a variety of different sources. As you'll see, wearing face masks and coverings is a required aspect of our campus-wide protocols. And practicing physically, physical distancing of at least six feet. These two measures, face masks and coverings and physical distancing are incredibly effective at preventing the spread of the virus. We also um, have a, a you know, um, installing uh, everywhere um, hand sanitation um, so that that is easy for people to do across all of campus. And as you'll hear from Vice Chancellor Kopstein, also um, implementing strategies for straightforward daily symptom monitoring. We have posted signage and instructions going up all over campus and also implementing cleaning and disinfection protocols to maintain our healthy environment. All of these protocols, yes, they seem complicated. And yes, it is a new way of living if you want to think about it in a COVID-19 world. And the way we're gonna be successful is by 
everyone, every individual sharing in these protocols as a shared responsibility. We know we can do this because of the success we've had so far on campus, but also because of the commitment of Vanderbilt individuals in terms of caring for one another. In addition to these prevention protocols, we've also been working very hard over the last several months in terms of thinking about how to help enable the physical distancing. That involves, as you'll see on the next slide, preparing our campus for this return to research and teaching. We've got to deploy our resources in truly, you know, radically different ways than we ever have before. Some of those resources involve, of course, um, our staff in terms of whether or not they will continue remote work wherever possible so that we are in effect de-densifying um, the campus to allow as much space as possible for our teaching and for our research missions. You'll see here in this picture, this is a classroom that uh, our facilities team has gone through to determine um, the physical distancing. Those are trash bags on the chairs. There won't be trash bags on the chairs when, when you arrive back on campus, but we're getting everything set up in advance so that we, we will have the classrooms and the instruction space ready to go. We've also had to reimagine housing and dining. I'll touch bases on that in a couple slides, but we're thinking through all possible ways to de-densify the campus so that everyone can um, uh, circulate from building to building and within buildings in a safe manner as possible. Now on the next slide, I talked about our, our research activities. So the other thing as I've noted is that since the middle of May, we have been ramping those research activities back up. And those have really been um, based within schools and colleges um, across all different disciplinary areas from um, the social sciences to the biomedical sciences to the engineering and also in terms of how our library has assisted many of our humanists in terms of their work. These research activities will continue to expand over the next couple phases of our planning and we will continue to um, help support our faculty and students in terms of their research activities. So now let's go on and really talk more specifically about the fall semester. So as we've noted, we've got to build a, a plan that has built in contingencies so that it can be as flexible as possible because of all of the potential unknowns that we may need to encounter. But what I will say is that in building this plan, we have made several very clear commitments. One of them, of course, is that fundamental commitment of providing an excellent education for all of our students. The plan includes, as you've heard, and we were very pleased to announce earlier this week, involves holding in-person classes for the fall semester. But we will have a fully developed contingency plan for online teaching. Our classes will have options for delivery by virtual and alternative platforms. So first, this provides the students who cannot get to campus due to either travel restrictions or health risk accommodations um, with the opportunity to continue making progress towards their degree. And it also allows students who do come to campus to know that should they become ill or have to self-isolate and quarantine during the semester, they can also continue making progress in all of their courses. To do this, we've been investing additional resources to advance the development of those virtual and alternative platforms because we want this to continue to be the very best educational experience but also we know that we have faculty who are in high risk health groups and they also need accommodations and will therefore need to be teaching through virtual or alternative platforms. In thinking about the plan, one key component was in terms of the academic calendar and utilizing that calendar to try to mitigate some of the risks that are known about COVID-19. You'll see this as we walk through it in terms of finishing classes before the fall or winter coronavirus season, which many public health epidemiologists um, think will happen in our area in the you know, late, late fall, December, January timeframe, winter. We're also um, eliminating travel breaks during the semester to mitigate the impact that those might have on the spread of coronavirus. And then also we wanted to build an academic calendar that started out with a full 15 week calendar and that 
allows for contingency of reductions or changes um, if that needs to happen. So on the next slide, I'll show you just the general components of a fall semester plan. This is complex. There are many, many different elements and there are many ad hoc working groups and committees that are working on all the different aspects of each of these components. So the first component that I'll show you again and talk through is the academic calendar that we announced. Our original start date for undergrad and graduate students was August 26. We're moving that up two days. What that allows us to do with the elimination of the fall break to mitigate travel risks is to complete in-person classes on November 20th. We can then let students leave and they will leave um, if they are able to um, for Thanksgiving break and have that Thanksgiving week off and remain home for the last week of classes um, which will be delivered online by virtual alternative platforms exclusively and then have remote examinations after that. So this calendar is what the undergraduate and the graduate school, the PhD students will be following. On the next slide, you'll see the layout for our um, professional and uh, professional schools. Uh, most of those professional schools will be following the same August 24th start date. All of them will be following the fact that there will be no breaks and that in-person instruction will um, end uh, and at Thanksgiving. You'll see that our law school has moved its start date up. So they will be starting um, earlier on August 17th. And that allows them to, with their um, in-class days, to complete all of their instruction and exams before Thanksgiving. There's more information on the graduate and professional programs and all aspects of their curricular um, opportunities on the respective websites for each of those schools and colleges. So in terms of thinking about um, academic options, what on the next slide, um, what you'll also find on our website materials is that we want to um, take every opportunity to protect our community as much as possible when we return to campus. But we know that there will be students who are not able to return due to personal circumstances. And so, we need those students to um, notify us and to fill out a remote study selection application. That's for the undergraduate students on the yes page, but for the professional graduate students, again, please visit your um, respective school and college websites for that information, which you can link to through the return to campus website. So next is in terms of thinking about the pros and cons. So this, all of our planning is undergoing stress testing, as I'd said, to ensure that before we have students come back, before we launch in-person classes, that we have tried to ensure that we've taken into account um, all potential variables that we know of. This particular um, plan that we've laid out, we think has a multiple pros. It allows for flexibility in terms of the multimodality of in-person as well as virtual alternative um, uh, curriculum presentation. It allows all students to be invited back together. So we are not selecting one class or one major or one cohort of students only, but we're inviting all students back. It minimizes the travel-based risks and it anticipates the annual coronavirus season as I noted in the late fall winter. It also allows still for our full Thanksgiving week, which allows um, families to plan travel in a more flexible manner for their students return. The cons are that of course, very much acknowledge that this calendar has no breaks in it. And I now acknowledge that we are going to need to and will um, provide additional support for mental health and wellness because of wanting to support students in a calendar that has no breaks. The other con of this is it does require additional effort for our faculty and staff to prepare their courses in both modes, but we are fully committed to our students in terms of providing them an excellent education and therefore feel that this is um, worth that additional effort. I'm also gonna acknowledge that life and classes on campus will be different. They will be different on every single campus across this country. And that's because of the physical distancing needs, because of the mask wearing, and because of 
um, other limitations in terms of sizes of gatherings, et cetera. And I'll also acknowledge that there's no plan that can mitigate all risk, but we feel that this plan is one which gives us that opportunity to invite our students back in as safe as possible conditions. Now, one question we get asked and we have thought about also very carefully and have analyzed from multiple angles is what would be a trigger wherein we would have to suspend in-person classes? Well, first I can tell you, we know much, much more now about how coronavirus spreads, how coronavirus um, can be treated, um, all who is most vulnerable to uh, severe illness with coronavirus, such that we're in a different place than we were at the beginning of March. We will be very closely monitoring our community so that there are no surprises. Now, of course, if local, state, or federal, national governments order a shelter in place or other restrictions, we are obligated to, um, of course, follow those and may have to shift to all remote. And the major criteria that's being followed in many areas is in terms of hospital caseload. We also will be closely monitoring our quarantine and self-isolation space capacity, and you'll hear more about that from Eric Kopstein. We also will be looking at surges in cases where there's an increased severity of illness amongst our particular campus demographic groups. And we also realize that there may be different university community conditions that might differ from local Nashville conditions that we might have to take into consideration. And then with a contract tracing analysis, which Eric Kopstein will also talk about, we'll be analyzing whether or not any increase in cases is tied to a specific event or if it's actually tied to rampant community spread with severe illness. We'll also have the flexibility with this plan where we could, for example, suspend activities in one part of campus, but not necessarily across the entire campus. So as we think about all the different things that need to happen to bring you back to campus, I know one thing you're really interested in is the classrooms, the courses, the instructional spaces. On the next slide, I show you another picture of a classroom that's getting prepared and it won't, the seats won't have blue tape on them to mark them off. But again, this was the exercise that we were going through. Um, our classroom and instructional spaces, uh, we are figuring out how, what classes can go in which rooms. We are setting up classroom protocols in terms of entry doors, exit doors, um, where the faculty member will be lecturing from. Um, you'll see on the next slide where I'll talk about um, in, uh, putting classroom technology into these rooms. We've identified over 200 ad additional spaces that we will be using for classrooms and instruction. And we have a centralized registrar system, which allows us to nimbly collect all this data and decide where is the best place for each individual class to meet. So on the next slide, I, I show you some of the um, additional work that's going into preparing. I mentioned that we're taking an inventory of all classrooms. That's an inventory not only of the space given um, physical distancing and how many students can be in that room for an in-person class, but also the type of IT and AV equipment in both our existing as well as our newly acquired space. Our schools and colleges and the faculty will be using all of this data to make course design decisions in terms of how are they going to um, instruct in the in-person, online, or potentially a mixture of those two. That information from the faculty then goes back to the registrar, and the, that is when, if there are any needs for schedule adjustments, our students will hear. So right now, I know our first-year students and our transfer students are in the middle of doing registration, and you should continue doing registration. You should continue signing up for your courses. And all of our students, if there is any need for a schedule adjustment, you will hear directly from a school dean or um, from uh, the registrar in terms of what that adjustment might be. 
And then when we get closer to the start of classes, we again will have an open registration period as we always do for students to make changes um, in their class schedule. And especially because I know we're gonna have some exciting new classes that um, the, the faculty are, are excited to launch um, that focus either on issues of the pandemic or issues of racial justice or other new, um, new coursework that they're excited to have the students have an opportunity to take. And on the right side, you'll see um, kind of a four prong approach to our adaptive educational design, again, including installing new IT technology, leveraging existing equipment in classrooms, as well as um, setting up asynchronous recording studios for the faculty to use and establishing a loaner laptop program. So on the next slide, we're gonna switch to um, residential life. So you've been in class, now you wanna know what are you doing outside the classroom? And I wanna assure you that um, we are thinking very carefully about how to work with the students, with student organizations, to have them plan how they're going to continue to build community and to interact in as safe as manner as possible. Um, some of the suggestions from a student-led virtual engagement planning group, and you can see um, sing-alongs, board games, watch parties, group meals and, in virtual ways, but also, um, the spaces that we're going through and analyzing include not only our classroom spaces, but also all of our um, common study spaces, our outdoor spaces, so that we can make as many areas as possible um, available for students to take breaks in and to um, have the opportunity to interact in, again, in physically distanced ways. Um, all, all of uh, the compliance with any type of guidelines that we put in place will as always be overseen through our student accountability office. So a key part of residential life is our um, residential housing for our undergraduates. And so for this, we have also um, analyzed a number of different reports that have given specific advice to universities in terms of residential housing. And from that, we have developed a Vanderbilt plan, which is prioritizing one, optimizing our resources that we have available, but and, and very specifically de-densifying our residential housing, and then also personalizing it to specific student population needs. So this will involve two different components. One, of course, is the use of single rooms, single occupancy rooms, but also we will um, have family unit models, wherein roommates and suite mates can be considered a family unit and be exempt within their rooms from social distancing. Part of this de-densifying is to decrease the student to bathroom um, facility ratio. And also in our bathrooms, we are um, looking at contactless feature, uh, fixtures, cleaning schedules, and yes, you might even have to sign up for a shower time, um, but this will all be um, worked out um, within the residential housing system and with student input in terms of how to best, um, best uh, uh, help you in, in your residential housing life. So as we go to the next slide, I wanna show you um, how we've planned for three different co cohorts that we think have different needs that we're trying to solve for. One is our first year students. So as you know, our commons experience is one of our uh, most most special aspects of our campus community. And we wanted to ensure that all students had the opportunity to live on the commons, but also that they were part of that community throughout their entire first year. We also felt it was important because of the um, commons being all doubles and triples and some of those being some of our smallest physically sized rooms and the fact that first year students do not know each other before they arrive that we offered all first year students single rooms. And so this requires that we have the first year students in two different locations. Half of them, them will be in the commons for the fall semester. The other half will be in Branscombe Quad and Carmichael Tower. And then in terms of allowing all students this opportunity, we will have them switch in January um, between the commons and the Branscombe Cod Towers. So they, they each have an opportunity to live in one of the commons houses. 
In terms of that switching, um, I know we've gotten some questions, so I'll address that here. Um, you don't have to worry. We will um, uh, provide those first year students with boxes before Thanksgiving. They'll just have to put all of their belongings in their boxes. And when they come back for the beginning of the spring semester, their belongings will have been moved to their, to their new room. And um, that, that we think will give everybody um, the support they need in order to have that happen seamlessly. For our upper division students, um, all who need or want BU controlled um, housing are, are, will be accommodated. Um, there will be singles within this model, just as there always has been, as well as that family unit model. And we are allowing all of our upper, upper division students to opt out and have an off-campus living option. And finally, for our student athletes, for our varsity student athletes, because of potential special protocols for their practices, for their travels and their competitions, we will be housing them all in one location together. And they will have um, roommates, which are teammates in terms of um, across their specific year, first year, second year, third year. But the first year student athletes will have Commons House affiliations, so they too will be able to benefit from that Commons experience. So on the next slide, um, the, the, now the number one question uh, is, when do we move in? And so in order to promote a safe move in, we are going to have to stage move in over multiple days during the week before classes. The first day of class, of course, being August 24th. In terms of the specific date you'll be moving in, those, that specific information and those schedules will be available in early July. And so you'll hear directly from housing in terms of those move-in schedules. So also tied to residential life is dining. And so for dining, this is something that is also getting a tremendous amount of effort in terms of thinking through. I'll tell you that our dining facilities have remained open. Um, of course, more limited locations during the summer. And this is allowing dining to um, already be implementing all of its new protocols and ensuring that um, those protocols are working really, really well. We'll continue to be completely committed to providing healthy and nutritious meal options. We're excited about the fact that the Nicholas S. Zeppos College Dining Hall will be opening in August and that adds another option in that West End neighborhood. We're gonna have an expansion of mobile ordering options. We're going to have a pickup spots where you could order a meal online and then pick it up at a convenient location. You'll be able to use your meal money or your Commodore cash for any of the taste of Nashville partner restaurants that are located around campus. And then campus dining is looking at hosting a rotation of food trucks on a daily basis, which again, you'll be able to utilize to, to give variety to your different, um, your, your meals throughout the weeks. So with that, I'm going to turn over the presentation to um, Vice Chancellor for Administration, Eric Kopstein, where he's going to tell you more about our campus planning and especially in terms of health and safety protocols. Well, thank you, Susan, for the opportunity to provide some updates today and many thanks to all of you who tuned in today. So incoming Chancellor Deermeyer and interim Chancellor and Provost Wente covered really a range of important topics, campus-wide protocols, a culture of responsibility, reimagining classrooms with physical distancing, how courses can be delivered flexibly, you know, investments we're making in technology to ensure an outstanding learning experience, undergraduate housing arrangements, and campus dining. So I'm gonna expand on the themes here by talking first about outdoor spaces and how to navigate campus during the fall. So we've carefully studied our outdoor environments and how members of our community will move from one area of campus to another throughout the day. Circulation plans are being implemented throughout the entirety of campus as part of our preparation efforts. Our goals in this regard are really several fold um, to ensure that movement around the campus is well organized, that pathways are clearly marked with signage and movement patterns are legible to ensure the movement of pedestrians and bicycles and really how those modalities of movement work together in the context of overall campus flow is clear and understandable. And that a well-defined circulation plan for campus navigation will help enable the safety of our community. 
Um, our exterior space and navigation plans are really guided by several core concepts uh, shown here. Start out simple and use time as an asset to study movement patterns around campus and be prepared to make necessary adjustments. We think we have a very good plan for campus navigation. However, this is an example of how our plans are built to ensure flexibility and can allow for changes and improvements based on data and observation. Um, our, our campus circulation plans acknowledge that people need room to move around and maneuver. We identify, um, as you can see on this map, a goal path that enables two-way circulation on campus paths that are wide enough to allow for uh, bi-directional movement across campus, while some of our other pathways will be established as one-way routes. People do require time to react to movement around them as they go from one place to another with physical distancing in mind, and our plans take that fact um, into account. We've underscored the centrality to our fall plans of supporting our mission and even seemingly secondary things such as identifying and following outdoor circulation plans enhances our ability to deliver our on-campus residential living and learning model during this unique period of time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So this kind of thinking extends beyond circulation and more broadly into Vanderbilt's many outdoor spaces. Our goal is for as many as possible of our beautiful outdoor landscapes and green spaces to remain open and accessible to maximize options for movement, for individual choice, and for physical distancing. We realize that our outdoor spaces have a range of uses. I mean, they're used to relax, to study, to eat, and our plans here are structured to ensure appropriate outdoor activities um, can continue safely and responsibly. We'll have highly visible signage installed throughout the campus that assists with wayfinding and highlights campus protocols and personal responsibility. Um, outdoor furniture volume and placement will adhere to physical distancing requirements and is also something we can adjust as necessary over time. Um, I like to think of the outdoor spaces of Vanderbilt's campus as a wonderful canvas that connects our buildings and we want Vanderbilt community members to access and utilize these spaces in responsible ways. Next slide, please. <clears throat> ah, testing, uh, tracing, separating. Vanderbilt will deploy a best-in-class COVID-19 safety and surveillance approach. Um, our plans and our principles are outlined in broad strokes here on this slide, and I'll expand on many of these points in my subsequent slides, but we will utilize expertise to inform our plans, and we are fortunate to have a wealth of expert resources, including the Vanderbilt Medical Center, the Vanderbilt School of Nursing, um, and our public health task force, all of which we are bringing to bear. We will be able to adjust our plans dependent on emergent situations and in coordination with updated public health guidance. We believe testing, tracing, and surge capabilities are critical functions we simply must have available. Um, we'll provide a holistic support model for the health and well being of our students. And we'll support the navigation of health needs with, uh, within our community and thereby we'll also be supporting the broader public health of Nashville. Next slide, please. So about five years ago, we launched VandySafe. This is a smartphone based app that includes a number of functions that are focused on the safety of our students, our faculty and our staff. You know, for example, you can contact our public safety dispatch center directly through VandySafe. You can real time chat with Vanderbilt Public Safety. You can send in observations and tips about occurrences and conditions on campus. Uh, you can even schedule a GPS tracked virtual walk home that can be monitored by our dispatch center or even by a friend or a parent. We've added a COVID-19 section to the app, which is still evolving. Um, it currently includes details on our return to campus plan and protocols, um, information on who to contact and what to do if you're not feeling well, information on a variety of other campus services, as well as a Vanderbilt specific symptom monitoring tool. So daily symptom monitoring, as Susan pointed out, is a requirement of our return to campus plan and the app will provide our students with a simple tool to conduct daily symptom monitoring. 
The symptom monitoring text is based on Center for Disease Control guidance, and it's made Vanderbilt specific. Uh, when a person completes the questionnaire in the sy sy uh, symptom monitoring app, they receive a red light, green light, indicating their current health status. We will monitor the completion of the daily screening and symptom monitoring outcomes through dashboards, and we'll route information to appropriate members of our community for any necessary follow-up. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, um, I'd like to talk about Vanderbilt's plans for COVID-19 testing. This, I think, is one of the most important aspects of our planning, particularly given the evolving landscape of testing capabilities. Our objective is nothing short of implementing an outstanding plan that will inspire confidence across our community, including with parents and also with the broader Nashville community. So as we developed our testing strategy, we knew that something as aggressive as rapid turnaround daily testing of all the members of our community is just not plausible currently. And it's also not in alignment with public health guidance. So we took a risk-based approach informed by public health guidance, our school of nursing um, and the Vanderbilt Medical Center. We broke the Vanderbilt community into various what we call risk-based groups um, this four squared graphic identifies four broad categories of the Vanderbilt community, and it identifies distinct testing strategies for these community segments. And it looks at them in terms of the number of people to whom a given strategy applies, as well as the intensity of the testing protocol applicable to each strategy. You can see the baseline strategy applies to all members of our community. And then as we move to the upper left quadrant, for instance, you see strategy one, which applies to high exposure faculty and staff for whom a greater than baseline set of protocols will be applied. Strategy two um, is for all members of the undergraduate population. And strategy three applies to student athletes who we realize are a subset of the undergraduate population, but for whom there will be a specific set of testing protocols. Um, I want to emphasize that the baseline strategy is the lower limit threshold for testing service for our community and our partnership with the School of Nursing and the Vanderbilt Medical Center are what enable us to deploy our baseline and even more stringent testing approaches for strategies one, two, and three. Um, our plans uh, do include a pre-arrival negative COVID test requirement for undergraduates in order to return to campus. You know, really the primary intent of this requirement is to identify asymptomatic infected students before they arrive on campus so they can stay home and recover before coming to campus. We are not going to be prescriptive about how a student receives a test. It could be through a local public health department, your doctor, or a minute clinic such as a CVS or a Walgreens. And our student care network uh, will assist and support families before arrival to identify testing options. We also will test all undergraduate students upon arrival to campus. We think this is a very important uh, protocol to help ensure the safety of our community. Um, I'd also like to note that our current plan is to use self-administered nasal swab PCR tests conducted under the medical supervision of our school, in nursing, our school of nursing and in partnership with the uh, Vanderbilt Medical Center. Post arrival, we will have the ability to test any symptomatic students, all asymptomatic students who came into contact with a positive COVID case and we'll conduct periodic ongoing uh, surveillance testing. Next slide, please. So with this arrival testing requirement established, I'd like to tell you more about how we'll carry out arrival testing at scale. Um, as our planning really crystallized, we realized that a physical location for high volume testing would not only be really helpful, but really absolutely necessary. So our planning led us to identify using a section of the David Williams II Student Recreation and Wellness Center for large scale testing. So testing at scale and having ongoing scalable capabilities post arrival, we think is a must have to accomplish our on campus residential living and learning and mission. And some of you are familiar with uh, the recreation center facility and would know that it has several advantages. It's large, it's secure, 
and it has excellent internet connectivity and VU um, card access. As you can see on this floor plan, we've mapped out circulation and physical layouts to enable and support large scale testing. We can also use the rec center to house the staff and the capabilities that support our testing and tracing incident command center. Um, our current plan can enable up to 18 testing stations that can handle up to 1500 tests per day. Some of you may have heard about our annual Flula Palooza event. We're during a single day on campus thousands of Vanderbilt University and Medical Center community members received flu shots. And it's exactly that type of tightly orchestrated high throughput approach that's the inspiration for what we intend to achieve around COVID testing. Um, it's also important to note that this physical plan is designed to enable the ongoing use of much of the rec center for its normal purposes of workouts and other health and wellness activities. Next slide, please. So the ability to conduct rapid, meaningful contact tracing is another key aspect of an overall disease surveillance program. Um, and so are plans to identify sufficient quarantine space for individuals who are awaiting test results. Um, the number of people who might be identified as contacts to a COVID positive person can become quite large. And in a campus environment, rapid contact follow-up will be very important to reduce spread, particularly within our undergraduate population. And so once again, our partners at the School of Nursing are stepping up to help. The School of Nursing um, includes a community health program and the curriculum for the community health program includes training for contact tracers and assigns nursing students to a particular community for purposes um, of their study. Vanderbilt um, is implementing a model with the assistance of our School of Nursing. We're under the supervision of experienced School of Nursing faculty. Nursing students will form a pool of contact tracers for VU undergraduate case, cases should we require surge capacity for contact tracing beyond what we can already do through our student health center. So the advantages of this model, um, I think are several fold. It is scalable. It utilizes the expertise of our School of Nursing and Medical Center, and it enables Vanderbilt to carry out contact tracing in a rigorous and controlled way. We're also um, exploring technology-based approaches to bolster um, even further the efficiency of our contact tracing program. Um, technology, we think, can play an effective part in the contact tracing process. However, it's not a substitute for the human element of follow-up. Um, so in other words, we'll have a contact tracing plan in place that doesn't rely solely on technology, but can be enhanced by it. And then also consistent with guidance from the Centers for Disease Control, we also note the importance of quarantining while test results are processed. The right hand section of this slide outlines the plan and locations for members of the VU community and where they will be expected to quarantine while awaiting their test results. Next slide, please. So Vanderbilt has a detailed plan for the quarantine and isolation of students who've been exposed to or tested positive for COVID-19. Students who've been exposed to COVID-19 and are awaiting their test results need to quarantine. And students who are positive, including asymptomatic positives need to be isolated. Um, our current plan includes a space allowance that can house almost 6% of the VU on-campus undergraduate population. This means at any given moment, Vanderbilt will be able to house 6% of the on-campus undergrad population that is either COVID positive or is being tested and awaiting results. Um, the Skerritt Bennett Center is located on the east side of campus and it's highlighted by the black circle to the left of the map on this slide. Um, while Blakemore House, which is identified by the circle to the right on the map, is located on the western side of campus. These two facilities provide 285 beds for quarantine um, and isolation purposes. The spaces are easy to access, but they remain relatively secluded from the denser parts of the central campus. Um, as we finalize our details concerning exactly how many students will live off campus, our quarantine and isolation housing plan uh, will be refined and we'll have more information on quarantine and isolation posted to our website. 
Next slide, please. So in addition you know, to physical health concerns resulting from COVID-19, nationally we are you know, sadly seeing increases in mental health concerns, particularly around social isolation. Uh, we think this trend will continue for the future and we know this is a concern for students and parents. Um, many of you may be aware that Vanderbilt already has a robust, holistic and integrated student care network that coordinates care and provides services and support for all of our students. Um, the Student Care Network right now has a comprehensive website for students and parents that identifies resources on wellness and how to approach and refer students about whom anyone in our community uh, may have concerns. Our Office of Student Care Coordination team really acts as a central hub to assess students' needs. They create student-specific plans to help students academically and personally, and they connect them with the right uh, resources. So we rolled this model out in July 2018 and it's been growing successfully ever since. And given the current environment with the pandemic and potential surges in mental health concerns, the Student Care Network is scaling up its operations uh, to make sure we can continue to serve students efficiently and effectively. Um, the Student Care Network is bolstering its staff to train students during this really unique time. And we're expanding our service modalities, including through telehealth um, and some revised drop-in opportunities. And finally, the incident management team for the testing and tracing center I mentioned earlier will be connected to the student care network to help ensure that COVID-19 related cases and their implications are all appropriately managed. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, Vanderbilt also uh, has implemented a health and information call center. I think of this as a hotline for members of the Vanderbilt community, including parents, um, to call to raise questions, to raise concerns, and to gather information. Um, even in the best of times, we feel, as you can probably imagine, um, a range of inquiries from our community, and being responsive is more important than ever as we approach the, uh, the fall term. We do anticipate a high volume of inquiries. And I think some of those inquiries I realize will probably be from folks who are on this webinar right now. So we've prepared our Vanderbilt call center team with consistent answers to a range of questions. And any questions raised that can't be answered by the call center will be referred immediately to a singular point of contact at Vanderbilt for quick follow-up. Um, I want to emphasize that our call center team is trained to listen carefully and to respond with consistency, with empathy, and with understanding. So that ends my section of this presentation, and I'm hopeful you can see that what we're doing is creating a holistic set of services that cut across residential living, testing, tracing, and community support. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it back over to Interim Chancellor and Provost Susan Wente. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Eric. And I just wanna take a few minutes um, right now at the end of our formal presentation and on this next slide to really come back to this concept of shared responsibility that each of us, every faculty member, every staff member, our postdoc scholars and our students need to be a part of. So before returning to campus, and this has been true for everyone who's already returned to campus, you'll be asked to sign a COVID-19 return to campus acknowledgement form. This uh, acknowledgement process explains both our safety prevention <clears throat> protocols. It also explains the risks and your responsibilities when you return to campus. We will take these protocols very seriously and intentional or reckless disregard for our policies and protocols will be directly addressed for students, again, through our Office of Student Accountability. Now, in terms of that shared responsibility, we also look at this as an opportunity to really show how Vanderbilt works together collaboratively and cooperatively, and that we look at this as a way to really um, help people do the right thing. One part of that will be through a new program called Public Health Ambassadors. And when we launched from phase zero, when we were basically shut down to phase one, we, um, our community service officers started this public health ambassadors program. 
This uh, allows us to um, ensure that people who are on campus have um, access to masks, have access to information that they need in terms of how they should be um, uh, taking care of themselves while they're on our campus. And we look forward to having some students join this public health ambassador program. Now, finally, on the last, this next slide, communication. You know, this town hall is an example of communication. Uh, many other aspects are a, a sign of communication, but we're gonna be taking new approaches, new strategies to share information and to ensure every member of our community knows everything that they need to do to protect themselves as much as possible. So we've got a new campaign that's launched. It launched on the day that we launched our plan, um, Anchor Down, Step Up. And I'm gonna let you watch this video so you can hear it yourself. So thank you for um, listening to this information. And now we're very pleased to take um, questions from that were both pre-submitted and also submitted during this webinar. Thank you. And you have covered a lot of very helpful information today. And a lot of the questions from our students and their families were actually included in that information that you have already presented. Uh, we did receive a large number of questions, so we won't be able to get to every question that was asked today, but we are capturing everything that has been submitted. Um, and we're working to address as many of your questions as possible. Over the next few days, we'll be adding more information to our return to campus website and updating the FAQs. Again, you can visit that website at vu.edu slash fall 2020. And as a reminder, you can also contact the fall 2020 helpline and that phone number is listed on the return to campus website. So on to the questions. Uh, we've heard from several families that they are concerned students will be isolated, particularly first year students and transfer students at a time when they need the chance to make friends and build community more than ever. Uh, can you address that? And related to that, will students be able to just hang out and socialize in shared spaces outside of their rooms? Well, absolutely, Kate. I um, understand and appreciate that question very much. We realize how important community and social bonds are to good mental health. And we have three distinct groups of people who are working on plans and practices to promote interaction. So one for our first year students, it's orientation group leaders. So those orientation group leaders are looking at, at how we will connect our new students with one another, um, like we have in the past, but also in new ways, through VU SEP program, through transfer student leaders, through orientation for international students, and many, many other resources. Um, students will absolutely have the opportunity to interact. Uh, I can see them you know, sitting in their doorway, um, physically distanced, talking through the night with somebody, uh, a new friend that they're meeting. So even though those first year students are in um, single rooms, even though our transfer students will be off campus, we will be working to connect them with one another and to help them build community. Thank you. It sounds like we're all learning new ways to socialize and connect. And um, it's great to hear how much these students will be um, thought of kind of in, in how we approach that connection for them. Right. We're also, I mean, I think uh, Vice Chancellor Kopstein touched on outdoor spaces. Mm -hmm. So we have this beautiful park-like campus and we are going to leverage every aspect of it to um, create many different spaces for safe interaction. 
That's great to hear. Uh, you touched a little bit earlier on this idea of virtual roommates for first year students. Um, Interim Chancellor Winty, can you and Vice Chancellor Kopstein talk a little bit about what that virtual roommate is and what that means? Well, um, so they first year students won't have roommates. Um, so virtual means uh, essentially they will um, have a fellow first year student that they may have been assigned as roommates if they had been in a double room, that they will be in the same house as them in terms of the, the commons house, and they will be able to um, connect and have camaraderie, um, you know, virtually, if you want to say. Now, they'll also be able to meet because they'll be on the same campus, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, the way I think of it is that if you are in Hank House 301, and your virtual roommate is in Branscombe, and I'm going to get the room numbers wrong because I don't know what the room numbers are in Branscombe either. But that's essentially who you'll be flipping rooms with, you know, at that mid-semester break. And I don't know, um, Eric, if you want to add to that. Yeah, I'll just add a little bit. I mean, 96% of our freshman students return to Vanderbilt for their sophomore year. And I think that statistic tells you just how seriously we take their acclimation um, into our community. I mean, really from the first day, we wanna welcome every student into a diverse community. Um, and students have these great opportunities to learn about cultures, traditions, other perspectives, and also to be themselves. Now, of course, the pandemic has challenged us uh, to be more creative than ever. And I also think the virtual roommate model is one way we can create really that critical sense of community that differentiates and distinguishes Vanderbilt. Um, virtual roommates are you know, essentially a new way to establish meaningful and lasting bonds uh, across all of our first year students. Great. Well, thank you. Um, another question we heard from a lot of, of parents and family members, is family weekend still happening in October? So we uh, waited to make that decision on family weekend until we knew whether or not we were going to be inviting students back to campus for in-person classes. Mm -hmm. And um, we thought about this quite a bit. The team has analyzed all aspects of it. And unfortunately due to, as you noticed in our plan, um, trying to um, you know, decrease travel to and from campus and uh, restrictions on large gatherings, We've just um, made the, the difficult decision that we are going to have to cancel this year's family weekend. And I know that's, that's very hard because I know um, visiting your child um, is, is very important and is a key part of you know, connecting and keeping connected. Um, but it was made, this decision is being made really based upon our health and safety protocols, as well as the data and expertise we have in terms of our need to de-densify and to hold um, events and to um, welcome individuals to campus in as safe a way as possible. So it's one of my favorite traditions. We're going to think of some virtual programming to do so that we're keeping parents up to date on what's happening on campus. And we'll be having um, those details will be shared in terms of that alternative um, programming directly with our parents and families. Great. It sounds like you certainly have in mind the health and safety of our, our entire Vanderbilt community, including parents and families. Mm -hmm. Um, we had a couple of questions about um, financial aid, and if students aren't able to return to campus for the fall, how will that affect their financial aid, and are any other updates being made to financial aid for the 2020-2021 academic <clears throat> year? And I believe our Vice Provost for University Enrollment Affairs and Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid, Douglas Christiansen, has joined the call, and he can respond to that particular question. Great. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, that's a really a great question. And to start off, I simply want to say that Vanderbilt is fully committed to working with our students who live on campus and those students that choose remote instruction relative to financial aid. As you know, Opportunity Vanderbilt is one of the top financial aid programs in the country. And while we're in unique times with this pandemic, our commitment to Opportunity Vanderbilt is stronger than ever. We have updated our website with the cost of attendance for our on-campus students and our off-campus students, excuse me, and not living with, who are not living with their parents. In addition, we have updated the cost of attendance for those students who are electing study to study remotely at home. 
Please note that the cost of attendance for those students studying remotely at home is less than those for studying on campus, reflecting lower housing and meal costs than those incurred for living on campus and off campus, not with your parent. However, your eligibility for need-based assistance remains the same and is based upon the following formula. Cost of attendance minus expected family contribution equals demonstrated need. In other words, what your family is expected to pay does not change based upon which method of learning you choose. Please know whether you choose an on-campus or remote instruction at home with your parents. We are ready to help you, guide you through this process. And again, Opportunity Vanderbilt being one of the top A programs in the United States, we are committed even in this very unique time to making sure we help meet your needs. Thank you. And Opportunity Vanderbilt is going 12 years strong and has been such a transformative program for Vanderbilt. So thank you, Vice Provost Christiansen. Uh, Interim Chancellor Wente, we got a lot of questions about student organizations. Can you talk about what student organizations and other student activities will look like in the fall? Well, absolutely. I guess I'd say first, it won't be one size fits all. And again, we're going to have to use our Vanderbilt um, you know, creativity and ingenuity and really um, come up with new approaches and new strategies. So the Office of the Dean of Students is spearheading this along with various groups of student leaders, um, all working on solutions for what will different types of um, student organization activities look like in the fall. It's student life is a really important aspect of the college experience. Um, I believe that entirely. And so we have to have um, activities, but we just have to be sure that we do them in a way that fits to our, our safety um, protocols and to prevent the spread of the, the virus. So I'm, I'm really gonna look forward to um, maybe even participating in some of these activities when they are, um, you know, when they roll out for this, this fall semester. I know you're, you're always very active on campus and very involved. And so I know um, you'll be right along there with our students finding new ways to be involved and active. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a question about international students. And I'm gonna ask our Vice Provost for Academic Advancement and Executive Director of the Provost Office for Inclusive Excellence, William Robinson, he's gonna join. And then I'm also gonna ask Vice Provost Christiansen to join in on this question as well. So hi to both of you. Uh, students from across the globe have chosen to study at Vanderbilt. How is the university planning to support its international students, including those who will be on campus and those who are unable to come to campus this fall? Well, thank you for the opportunity to respond about our plans to support our international students. So as stated, I do lead our Provost Office for Inclusive Excellence. Uh, the three guiding principles of our office are academic advancement, belonging and inclusivity, and cultural awareness demonstrated through both education and practice. So we support our undergraduate students, our graduate students, and our professional students through the programming of our four identity centers, uh, the Bishop Joseph Johnson Black Cultural Center, the Margaret Cunningham Women's Center, the Casey Potter Center for LGBTQI Life, and the Office of the University Chaplain of Religious Life. We also have several identity initiatives, one of which is specifically for our international communities. So our international students are an important part of our Vanderbilt's educational community. So through this initiative for international communities, uh, we're gonna create an advisory board of students and faculty to provide input and guidance to my office on the types of programming that are important. Uh, also, as well as how to best offer those programs to reach as many students as possible. So for example, we're looking forward to implementing a programming theme uh, called Demystifying the Hidden Curriculum, which would provide insight about maximizing success for students at Vanderbilt. Uh, we will also continue to support heritage activities that celebrate the diverse culture of our international students. So Vanderbilt, as mentioned before, Vanderbilt provides support for mental health and well-being through our Office of Student Care Coordination. And also, just like our teaching for the fall semester, our programming that we deliver uh, will be uh, a combination of in-person, uh, virtual, as well as alternative methods so that we can support those students who are on campus, as well as those students who are unable to come to campus. So thank you. I suppose, Chris Jansen, did you want to add to that? Yes, um, thanks. Um, thanks. Great, great explanation, William. One of the areas I have the opportunity to work with is the Office of International Students and Scholars. And the primary purpose of this office is to partner with our international undergraduate, graduate, and professional students as they navigate the various visa compliance processes, both as new entering students and as returning international students each year. 
Additionally, we support our international students through workshops where they are required where they are required or have the opportunity to participate in off-campus practical experiences. In the context of an F1 or J1 students and in the, the federal regulations, this is defined as practical training. There are three main types of practical training, curricular practical training, optional practical training, and academic practical training. These workshops are designed to help you understand the federal guidelines and assist you throughout this process. In addition to the Office of International Students and Scholars though, our international students are supported in many ways throughout the campus in programs such as orientation, immersion project planning, programming through the identity centers as William has already noted, and connecting our international students to the broader Nashville community through various types of direct programming that will support both our on-campus and remote international students. However, I would like to say, Kate, I think the most important thing we do as an institution to support our international students is the true belief and core value of how important their views are on our campus and collectively how we learn in this large world, bringing thoughts together and different perspectives and the support that comes from that in new learning and knowledge. That is the great support for our international students, but also great support for our domestic students as they learn together. Great, thank you so much, Vice Provost Robinson and Vice Provost Chris Jansen. Um, somewhat related to that, um, this question of what, what will the classroom experience look like for all of our students? And Interim Chancellor Wente, I think you can answer this question. What will the classroom experience be for students, whether in person or remote? And if a particular student needs to quarantine, will they be able to easily switch to remote only for their classes? So, um, for students who are attending in-person classes, as I showed you in some of those slides, some pictures of classrooms, there are gonna be physical distancing measures so that that six foot physical distance will be in place in classrooms. That may mean that the layout and the configuration of the classroom will be different, but the in-person quality will be very familiar, um, you know, aside from that physical distancing aspect. Specific classroom protocols are currently being finalized and those are in close consultation with our medical center and the School of Nursing and, and also getting input from um, faculty and students in terms of reviewing those classroom protocols, if you want to, to say it in that way. As for alternative and virtual platforms, um, these might be in uh, an asynchronous lecture, for example, that you might listen to um, at any particular time. They might be a synchronous lecture where um, you actually are seeing the in-person class in progress and are participating in it, or there might be other um, pedagogical approaches that the faculty will choose to deploy. So those decisions as um, we're going through the process of determining um, where classes will be in terms of the number of in-person students um, will be part of the registrar information that students will be able to um, see and, and be able to, um, uh, un, you know, uh, be able to see how a class is being offered, okay? First, now your last part was absolutely for students who are quarantining or self-isolating or, you know, do not feel well we want them to be confident that they'll be able to continue to participate in their coursework if they um, feel, feel well enough, of course, um, and not fall behind in that co coursework. So um, they'll be able to uh, immediately flip to whatever the you know, remote option is during those couple days or during the 14 day um, self-isolation period. That's, that's good to hear. And, and certainly, again, it goes with everything that you've been describing of putting health and safety as much as we possibly can at the forefront. Um, Interim Chancellor Wente, this is a question that I think you might be able to address. Um, one of the live questions that came in, will students be allowed to leave campus during the semester for activities in Nashville? And what guidance will you have for them if they do so? Right. So um, we are asking students to stay in the greater Nashville area during the course of the in-person semester, but we know many of them will have, um, if you want to say experiential um, learning experiences that involve going to sites within Nashville. And so we will be asking them to follow all the health and safety protocols that that particular site requires. 
Mm -hmm. And also, um, if that particular site has health and safety pro um, guidelines that are not as stringent as, as ours, we'll be talking to those sites in regard to that so that we're sure that um, taking part in that activity doesn't put them at risk. So um, we have um, groups that are, we know where we, we send students for those experiential activities and we will be um, working with those sites in regard to that. Great, thank you very much. Um, Vice Chancellor Kopstein, I think you can address this next one, which is connected to um, the question earlier regarding family weekend and bringing visitors to campus. Are there, are there restrictions on parent visits to campus this coming year? I know that we have policies in place with regard to campus visitors overall, but can you talk a little bit more about what this might look like for parents in particular? Yeah, well, during the, uh, you know, the move-in process, we, we'd like to really, and throughout the year, um, reduce the density of human beings on campus. So during the move-in period, there'll be one uh, parent I think will be allowed to attend a student's move-in. And then um, throughout the year, we'd really appreciate it if uh, you know parents were not coming to visit with any uh, great frequency, simply because we're worried about the potential spread um, of the virus. I don't know, Susan, would you like to add to that? No, I think, um you know, we are continuing to adapt our protocols and we'll have more information that as we get closer to campus or to the launch of the in-person class date. And I think that um, that we will adapt those visitor policies as we see fit based upon what's happening on campus and what's happening in the Nashville community. But I think, you know, this is a time for us all to take precautions in terms of our personal travel. And so um, I think what we wanna focus on doing is getting the students back for their education and their scholarship activities and ensuring that they can do that as safely as possible. Thank you. Um, we had a particular question about the quarantine and isolation locations. Who will be staffing the quarantine and isolation locations and what care will be provided? And then as a follow-up, if hospitalized, will students be sent to Vanderbilt University Medical Center? Um, and Interim Chancellor Wente, Vice Chancellor Kopstein, I think you can both speak to this. And we also have Linda Norman, who is the Dean of the School of Nursing on the call, who um, I believe can also speak to this. Well, we were fortunate to have an outstanding housing and residential educational program um, here on campus. And our O'Hare team will act as one really important point of coordination, but there will be a multi-pronged approach to how we staff this. The School of Nursing uh, will provide various services, including potential in-person visits for students, including telehealth visits, daily symptom monitoring screenings and frequent check-ins to ensure that a student's condition is not um, deteriorating. We'll also be tightly connected with our dining program so that food can be dropped off and delivered uh, in a timely manner and that we're gonna be highly responsive and tightly in communication with any student in quarantine or isolation should they have um, specific needs. Uh, Linda, you may wanna to add to that. We're developing the um, protocols that we'll use in order to be able to best meet the needs of the students because we feel that um, having some daily nurse check in with them uh, to be able to uh, assess the symptoms that they're having and then to figure out do they need to be referred be it to student health or to another clinical uh, type of facility to, to meet their needs. That what we hope <clears throat> is that um, they'll be able to stay in their quarantine and, and recover, but we're gonna be uh, working with them and uh, we'll be able to have a touch point so that if parents need to call us as well, we'll uh, be able to respond to their questions. And, and I'll just add to that, that um, our student health center is run by Vanderbilt University Medical Center. So we have a direct connection and a direct link to um, the, the medical center through that student health center. So we are leveraging all of our really tremendous resources in terms of our you know, highly ranked school of nursing, as well as our medical center 
And you can see, you know, behind Dean Norman, um, she's got in her background, the School of Nursing's new entrance, and, and it's uh, directly connected to the medical center. Um, because we're all on one campus, which is also, I think, um, a, a huge, huge advantage to our students, staff, and faculty that, that we are so, um, so not only collaborative in that one Vanderbilt way, but also physically connected. That's something I, as, as someone who has a degree from Vanderbilt myself, I can say that was one of the best parts of that experience was how closely we have been able to work with um, Vanderbilt University Medical Center and really get all of the benefits of that medical research and those practices and, and really that one Vanderbilt feeling. Um, Another question that we had uh, came from a number of transfer students as well as their families. Vanderbilt has a great reputation for how we bring transfer students into our university community. What's being done differently this year to ensure that transfer students get the full Vanderbilt experience given that they must live off campus in order to help reduce density for on-campus living? Interim Chancellor Wente, I think you may be able to address that one. Yeah, um, I mentioned this a little bit earlier in terms of um, one of the groups which is actively working on how are we going to create community and create social interactions for our transfer students and help them onboard. So we have a specific um, transfer you know, orientation onboarding program and in, in they're in groups that they stay with, you know, throughout, um, throughout that uh, that first part of that first semester. But in addition, a new program that we're launching this year that I think will be incredibly important for our transfer students is the Campus Connectors Program. So this is where every single student not only has their faculty advisor, who's helping them in terms of academic selection of courses, but every single student will also have a Vanderbilt staff member who will be a Campus Connector. This might be somebody from the Career Center, it might be somebody from the Immersion Office, it might be somebody from it, within academic affairs um, who they can go to to get guidance on how to find any resource that they need. And so this will be, um, it's a new program. We've had, a, uh, we've rolled it out. There's a website on it. And I think that that Campus Connector program along with our, our transfer orientation program will be um, a very robust way to provide them with resources and support. Great, thank you. And I, I believe you can find more information on that Campus Connector program on the Return to Campus website as well. Um, we want to be mindful of everyone's time this morning. We know it's a Saturday for everyone. Um, and we, so we're just going to take one more question um, and then we'll again point you back to the website for the many other questions that we got that we'll continue to answer there. Um, and Aaron Chancellor Wente, I think we've got one last question for you. Uh, we've had some questions from seniors and others about the availability of classes this fall. Can you provide more insight about the range of courses that will be available for students, particularly those who opt to, for remote study? So our plan is that um, all of our in-person classes will be available remotely. Um, of course, there are some experiential based courses for which that um, may be more limited. But um, I think that uh, in terms of courses that are available, um, I know that there's some new courses that are gonna be coming out with the new online registration that I had mentioned that students will have the opportunity to take, um, whether they are things that have to um, do with the pandemic or to do with racial justice or to do with the national elections that are upcoming, some things that are very topical and very focused. But every um, faculty advisor and the associate deans will be working directly. We wanna be sure that if there are any seniors who are worried about whether or not they're gonna be able to get their courses that they need to graduate, you know, those associate deans will work very closely with those students to ensure that they stay on track for a degree. Great. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we'll conclude the question and answer portion of this. And I wanna thank everyone again for all of the questions that we got today. We had quite a few. And so for those that we weren't able to answer, the university is gonna to continue to add responses to the return to campus website. That's vu.edu slash fall 2020. And you can also call the fall 2020 helpline for more information. And with that, Interim Chancellor Wente, I will turn it back to you. 
Well, I just want to say that I hope that this information has provided clarity. I hope it's brought some comfort to you as we continue to look ahead. I want you to know that everyone on campus is so excited about welcoming our students back for an in-person experience and also very committed to ensuring that even if you aren't able to return to campus for in-person that we're providing you with an excellent, outstanding um, experience. And, and I'm really looking forward to hearing every, hearing from you um, once we've started classes back up or even before if you have any questions, but especially hearing from you in terms of, of uh, what you find new and exciting and challenging um, in how we're rolling things out for you. And with that, I wanna um, uh, let incoming Chancellor Daniel Deermeyer um, sign off for us and give us the final comments. Well, thank you. Thank you, Susan. And I wanna thank all of you for participating today and for joining us uh, for this conversation. Uh, as you've seen, there was a lot of detail and uh, we wanted to share the detail with you so we had a sense of the diligence and the care that went into putting this plan together. And I wanna again, thank uh, Eric and Susan and everybody who was participating in putting this tremendous effort together. That diligent work will continue over the summer. Um, as you see, there's still there's details that need to be worked out. Um, and um, we're committed to making sure that this will be the great experience and the great education that Vanderbilt is known for you as we welcome everybody back um, on campus in the fall. Um, I think the last thing I want to point out is that I want to thank you for your patience and for your commitment to Vanderbilt. These are difficult times. There's a lot of uncertainty here. And, um, and, and I want to thank you for, for, for having that patience, for working with us through that. I think we're in a good place. Um, there's a lot of flexibility. We're dedicated to a mission. And the plan is based on the best available information from the public health and safety side uh, that, that we can bring to bear. With that, I want to thank you again for joining all of us today and happy Father's Day and uh, we'll see all of you back in the fall. Thank you very much.